everybody. This is uh, Center of Government Operations. It is Tuesday, February 9th, I believe. Um, this is Senate Government Operations. And we are looking today at the proposal uh, that came from the administration around the um, creation of an agency of public safety. We, um, there is no longer an executive order because the House has opposed it. So we're not, we don't have to talk about an executive order at all. However, there is, um, we do have some interest in, in creating an agency of public safety. And what we wanna do is hear from people around what that would look like, how it should be structured. Um, we, I don't know if uh, Commissioner Sherling is on here with us, but he, oh, there he is. Um, we're working to put together some kind of a draft bill um, that we can all respond to. But today we're going to look at um, just people's ideas and whether it's a good idea and how it should be structured. So I am going to say that for people who are on here that aren't normally on here, we do not use chat because chat is a sidebar conversation. And if we were in a committee room, we would not allow it. We would tell you to go out into the hall and have your conversation. So we don't allow it here either, except for Gail to post um, links to things that people might bring up that are of interest to people. Um, and we will, I will call on different people to speak to us. I'm going to, other than Bill Sheets and Bill Sorrell, is there anybody who has a time constraint that we should be paying attention to? Anthony, were you raising your hand because you have a time constraint or were you fixing your computer? <laughs> You're on mute now. <laughs> I was raising my finger to mute myself. <laughs> okay. No, I'm sorry I'm a little late. No, that's fine. That's fine. We just are getting started. So does anybody else have a time constraint and need to go sooner rather than later? Okay, I don't see anybody. Madam if Chair, I, I just wanna say I never got lunch, so I'm listening, but I'm just making lunch. Oh, well, you can eat, we eat in committee a lot. I'm still like in motion. So then okay. I will be on video, so. Okay. <laughs> so um, with that, then I think that we'll just jump right into it and go to Bill Sheets and Bill Sorrell first, and I don't know how you want to do this, but there are implications the way the executive order was written. And if we look at it as a bill, there are implications for the council and for the um, academy. And I think that Mark Anderson also, I think you are connected to the council in an official way. So we'll also hear from you about that, but I'll go first to Bill Sheets and Bill Sorrell because I know they have to be out of here. So. Thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate it. Uh, Bill Sheets, uh, it's good to be back in front of you. It, uh, I, I guess I would defer to any questions. I'll just start uh, very broad based. I think that just from, I, I like your distinction, Madam Chair, there, there really could be some clarifying language that the academy is kind of a subset of the larger criminal justice council. So I certainly believe that the academy piece uh, should not have the autonomy that it's had in the past and should be held more accountable in the form of an agency or something similar. I think for efficiency, effectiveness, uh, it's, it would be much better. Uh, I think budgetary wise, uh, I, I come here with a fairly vast amount of experience with budgets and to say that the budget here is, is thin uh, and 92% above and beyond our control. I wonder that if in the last decade, if we were under an agency umbrella, uh, our budget would look a little bit different, that we would have additional resources and a mechanism to uh, be more effective in, uh, in, our budget, uh, in our budgetary response. I think, I think there is a concern. Uh, I've heard it now as part of the council and in my role as the interim executive director over 
how we keep the autonomy of the new 24 person council. And I think it's critically important. So I, I don't know if that could be done through language, but I do think that even though we're closely related, there is a distinction between the 12 full-time equivalent law enforcement professionals here at the academy compared to the 24 person criminal justice council. Yeah, and I think that that is important. And I think that we can, that those are the kinds of thing, details that we need to um, address. And I'm glad we can do this um, as a in, a, in statute, because the it's hard to get into that detail in an executive order. So, but in terms of the academy, you do think that it belongs. Yeah, autonomy is a wonderful thing until it goes wrong. And there's only one way to ensure that it uh, doesn't go wrong, and that's through direct accountability. And in this case, uh, this position reports directly to the administration loosely, uh, and of course to the council, but uh, that's only as good as the person sitting in this chair. And uh, there should be some, uh, some further accountability uh, through an agency. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Bill Sheets? Just a, Senator just, Polina. just a quick one, because I think you mentioned this, but you think it would have budgetary benefits as well? Senator, I, I don't think it could hurt. Uh, again, we are as thin as possible. I appreciate the opportunity. I know we got to speak about it last week, all of the implications on S-124. I just think that a larger organization would be forced to support us. Uh, and, and we would not have the option of having certain things uh, unfunded. It'd be a bigger, stronger, more collaborative voice towards funding. Right. Thank you. I, I think that one of the thoughts from the uh, department was that some of the business administration functions could be done by a support um, division in the in the agency itself. So Senator Clarkson. Uh, thank you for that. I, I think that's what Anthony raised, it raises what, what both of you are raising. It, critically important to have an advocate who's in at a cabinet level. I mean, so if, when you're in the agent, if you're, and when you're in the agency, you will have a, an articulate advocate at the table with, you know, in that whole budgetary process, which is quite different from what the way it is now. So I, I think you'd benefit by an elevated uh, articulate advocate. Any more questions for Mr. Sheets? So Mr. Sorrell, and I see Cindy is also here with us. Um, would you like to talk to us about the, the council now as a, and we know, we know they're connected, but we also know that they are separate. And you are on mute, Bill Sorrell. There are people who've been trying to tell I, I you that it. for a long time. I think I got it. You got it. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak a bit about these matters. Uh, and I'm not fully on the same page as uh, Bill Sheets, for whom I have the utmost respect, but we're close. Uh, first, just generally on the concept of an agency of public safety, unless I'm having a, a senior moment, I attended the Grafton conference back, I think it was in the early 90s or so, on the idea of the creation of uh, an agency of public safety. And I would, uh, uh, and, and I, I think I was at that time either had just left as Chittenden County State's Attorney and was Administration Secretary or was still uh, the, the State's Attorney, uh, is my recollection. Uh, and in any event, uh, I, I thought there were real benefits to uh, the creation of an agency of public safety, and I still do. Um, as far as the Academy goes uh, separately. I do see benefits in budgeting, uh, IT issues and the like, uh, being able to take advantage of an agency 
structure, which typically has, uh, you, you know, a, a sizable uh, contingent of folks working on either IT or budgeting issues, contracting issues, uh, grant writing, grant administration, and the like. So I see some, uh, some real potential benefits there uh, for the academy. Then there's the question of funding. And I would agree that there's, there are potential funding benefits when you're divvying up a large pie with how the fifth floor the, and the secretary sort of divvy up that pie, even though the legislature, you know, kind of says that the Department of X gets this and the Department of Y gets that. Money, you know, from my five years as administration secretary, money moves around and there are differing priorities. Commissioner Sherling, I know, thinks that the training side of the, the academy and its operations are underfunded. I've heard him say, and, and he can correct me if he's on, but I, I've, I've heard him say, he thinks it's, it might be a million and a half dollars underfunded. And there's no question, but that he is a strong advocate for the academy and for police training and for the council. I mean, he's the first one who called me about taking over as chair. That being said, we're level funded in the governor's recommend. Despite all of the additional duties that are put on, we say the council, but the lion's share of the work is actually going to be done in the the training and the, the 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 so so much of the work in S124 that is given to the count to the council is going to be done by academy staff and we have some very real needs to remotely come close to meeting what we see is our responsibilities under S-124. And yet we're level funded. And so we're left and we have to get off at two o'clock because we have to go to the appropriations committee. Uh, and we're gonna be in there pitching for more money than the administration is recommending that we receive. If we were in an agency setting, I've been there, I've done it. Those who go in and try to say the governor has it wrong, our department or our agency should be receiving not only X, but X plus Y. They're not the most popular people at cabinet meetings or other similar gatherings. And in, in my view, I, I mean, I'm not worried about myself. No one's going to call me from anywhere in state government and say, you got to shut up in terms of what you think the, the council needs to do its job. I, I mean, I'm not worried about that. But an executive director who was ultimately appointed by the governor might, might find himself or herself in a bit of a pinch between really espousing, I mean, you can espouse all you want to your secretary, but uh, to be espousing before the legislative branch on what your financial needs are. Uh, that concerns me. Uh, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it's financially advantageous to the council and the council's responsibility for the operations of the academy to have to, to, to be in the 
agency. The, the, the jury sort of out on that for me and, and, and our current experiences are all that I have to go on. And uh, we're going in slugging for ourselves uh, before the appropriations committee in about 10 minutes. The last thing I would say, I apologize for taking too much time, is uh, another matter that doesn't have anything to do with finances about the, the potential merits of the independence of the council. I think what the legislature was trying to do, uh, you know better than I, but to put more voices into uh, 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 the, the creation of policies involving the operation, the, the recruitment, the training, the disciplining uh, and policies for law enforcement. And if the council loses its independence, those who are calling for other citizen oversight groupings over law enforcement statewide, uh, to, to the extent that the council is now, even though it's made up of significant numbers of law enforcement, they don't have a majority and it's, it functions as an independent body. And I think I'd like to think longer and harder before I say it's a good idea that the council loses that independence. So I, I'm gonna ask if anybody has questions, but I think that that is a, a huge issue and that's been brought up to, be, to me by a couple people and which is one of the reasons why doing this statutorily instead of in an executive order language can be put into there to assure that independence. Yes, Ed, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, committee members, are there any questions? Cindy, would you like to add anything here? Good afternoon, Senators. I'll just really briefly say I second if there is a restructuring to occur what Executive Director Sheets mentioned and the distinction between the Council and the Academy. And I've worked there a long time and I've spent a lot of time explaining to people um, that yes, I, my, the agency I work for is the Criminal Justice Training Council. And then we also have this sort of board of directors that is the council. And sometimes when um, like directives come down, people are confused over whether or not it's the, the board of directors, council members responsibility or the employees of the agency that I work for is responsibility. And, and so some clarity there, if it could be added would be mm -hmm. helpful, I think. Um, the Academy is a, is a location and a program um, but it's not the agency that we all work for. The agency is the Criminal Justice Training Council. So it's just confusing. And I think if it could be cleared up, that would be helpful. So when we move further into this, if we do, I would like to um, make sure that perhaps you work with um, our legislative council and with it, all the, those players to get that language in there. And I know that uh, Mark Anderson has some concerns about that also. Um, committee, uh, Senator Rahm. Um, I just wanted to ask, is it, is it Chairman Sorrell? Are you chair of the board? I'm chair of the okay. Criminal Justice Council. Yes, Council, sorry. Um, I just want to ask Chairman Sorrell, do you currently, would you currently say you report to someone right now or do you function in this kind of independent oversight way? Well, I was appointed by the governor. The governor under S-124 gets to appoint the chair of the council. Uh, but do I work for the governor? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I uh, and the governor's free to ask for my resignation any day that he might want, but uh, I don't need to check with anyone before I exercise my responsibilities as, uh, uh, as chair obviously might seek some legal advice on some things and the like and appreciate and need that, but, but no, uh, uh, I'm independent. Th thank you. I really found your testimony very compelling. On this thank issue. you, Senator. Senator, <laughs> Senator Clarkson. Uh, I, I would agree with uh, Keisha. Uh, I, I, I think there are lo lots of advantages to being in independent and it would be great actually if Bill, you'd think about some examples of, of where that's been really important. 
um, because the governor appoints you, the governor can remove you, but you, the key thing is you don't have to check in with somebody all the time to make sure that it's okay to do I something. Do not. Right. right. And that is uh, critically important and every legislator can appreciate that. Um, but if there were a couple great illustrations of where that was important in your mind, that, that would, I think, be helpful. Well, uh, thank you, Senator. First and foremost is the one I mentioned that uh, uh, Executive Director Sheets and I at two o'clock are testifying on our budgetary needs. Right, right. But, but I'd certainly be thinking about others that, uh, and if I come up with them, I'll, uh, I'll bring them to your attention. Right, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for them? And I understand you have to go. And I, I know that Mark, um, Sheriff, I'm sorry, Sheriff Anderson brought this issue up to me um, last week and about the maintaining the independence of the council. And um, so if you come up with some language, um, I would maybe ask, uh, Mark, what is your, Sheriff Anderson, what is your role with the council? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so for the record, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff, I am uh, the Sheriff's Association's appointee to the council. Okay. Uh, so I fill one of the 24 seats uh, identified in S-124, but also prior to that. So if, if you would be, um, have any suggested language that we talked about, work with um, Mr. Sorrell and uh, Sheets and uh, Commissioner Sherling, or um, whoever is going to be writing this um, potential bill for us. Uh, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to do that, Madam Chair. Uh, and I also, uh, not to say that uh, the language is exactly perfect, but uh, Commissioner Sherling's uh, ten-point uh, modernization strategy does discuss it. Uh, I believe the words were enshrining in statute uh, the purpose and the mission of the council, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that that is a an excellent starting point, if not even the finish point. Yeah. Thank you. So any other questions on this issue of the Academy and the council right now? And um, so I think our, our committee or my intention, and I don't know if the committee even agrees with me, is to try to create a bill that we could then look at to see and have people testify on. But I wanted to get this initial conversation first from people so that we had an idea of uh, all the things that might need to go into a bill. And Commissioner Sherling, did you have your little hand up? I did, the tiny little hand. Um, <laughs> I, I, thank I, you. I can just barely see that tiny little hand. Um, I just wanted to flag for you, Madam Chair, as we discussed earlier in the week, there is a draft in progress. We hope to have mm -hmm. it to you within a day or so. It's, we just couldn't get it done uh, for this morning because uh, there's a lot to put in there, including uh, uh, as Sheriff Anderson indicated, we've been talking about this for uh, more than a year. Um, every iteration, including the executive order, has all uh, called out the need for the council to retain its independence um, in much the same way that we call out the uh, on a different, uh, similar parallel path, the 911 board um, retaining its independence as well if it were to come mm -hmm to an agency. And I, I testified to that fact, I think, before your committee just a, a week or so ago. So I just wanted to ensure that that folks are aware that that is not in any way a point of contention. Um, so. Right. Thank you. And just Senator Rahm, just one second. And I, I just so that you know, Senator Rahm, I don't know that other committee members know this, but we have actually had a similar bill in front of us at least twice in the past. Um, and the last time I believe that it got um, interrupted because there wasn't a lot of time and uh, just some other things happened, but um, we have been considering this for some time. So did you have a question? I did. I mean, I, <clears throat> this might be work the committee has already done to explore what independence means, but I, I just ask the commissioner, um, would would he imagine having any sort of oversight role with whoever is chairing the council or having any sort of having that person as a direct report or having that person have a direct line to the governor? 
No, uh, we don't envision any changes to the structure responsibilities of the council. The only change would be as, uh, as I've testified to previously, the, the support the council would get for his operations would move from a 10 person uh, operation and a $2 million budget to a 600 person operation and a $130 million budget. Those are the what what might might be considered the business functions. Yeah. Yes, as, a, uh, the, as opposed the to island, policy. It, exactly, the council would continue to set policy as directed in statute. Continue to have their oversight role relative to professional standards as memorialized in statute. Um, they would just get. Uh, access to a, a much larger array of resources with the operational components of the academy connected to uh, a cabinet level um, organization. So in these, I, uh, there's no, um, I don't know that there's a polite way uh, to say this. There are these various islands in state government that have been created over the decades and they get lost um, in the shuffle. Um, it is really hard to come in with a $2 million budget uh, sitting on an island as the, the council or the academy or however um, it's portrayed in various testimony um, when you're up against the two and a half billion dollar agency of human services budget. You know, we have trouble going up against some of those, those large uh, programmatic needs. Uh, so, um, I do not see any downsides to um, the resource allocations that would go with uh, attaching the operations of the academy uh, to whether it's a department of public safety or an agency of public safety or the agency of administration somewhere. Um, I think it makes the most sense to be attached to public safety because it's directly aligned in mission and further fragmentation is what we're trying to avoid. Um, but I do not see any budgetary downsides. And I'll also observe that uh, having been in commerce for three years, this construct is, is pretty normal. And we actually have it in public safety. The fire training council operates independently and guides fire training. And we don't touch that. We just execute what, uh, what that independent um, multi-agency uh, council directs. Um, so... Uh, and the same thing happens in commerce. There are a variety of independent boards and commissions. Um, I think the Secretary of Commerce is appointed to something like 60 uh, various boards and commissions. Some of them uh, are get all of the resources of the agency, but do not report to the Secretary. Same construct. Senator Rahm, did you have another question? I did, and, and I'm sorry to do this um, if, if the chairman has to to leave right now, but I'm, I'm actually asking the commissioner, I don't sort of doubt your professionalism, so I don't want it to seem that I am, but as you say, there's no downsides. I'm just really curious, um, are there <clears throat> any certain resource allocations or personnel support systems where you could see any delay in getting something to this kind of council that has independent oversight functions that could have you accused of sort of slowing down what they're doing, et cetera. I mean, I'm just trying to understand what, it, islands are important sometimes. Um, and so, you know, I'm just asking you what kind of resources and personnel would they be getting and how could that potentially interfere with their work more than help it? Um, I'm not exactly sure I'm following the question because it sounds, can, can well, I you're throw asking something what, here? what resources would be going, but how would it would interfere with operations. So I'm not sure I'm following the... Maybe I can give an, a, an example here. And I, I don't foresee this happening. But um, instead of you have a grant, you have a division of support services. And one of those is potentially grant writing. So there's a grant that's available. And the grant writer says, yeah, well, I'm not going to do that one for the academy, because I don't think they're important. Is that what you're referring to? Senator Rahm, something like that? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand where it might be beneficial to be reliant on a larger organization, but where that could become a dependence that's harmful to the independent function of this kind of organization. But the academy isn't independent. The council oh. is. 
I'm sorry, I wasn't specifically speaking to the academy. Um, I was speaking to possible independent oversight functions of the council. If we were to, if it's the legislature, I think would like to continue to have some independent oversight of public safety functions. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm not following the question. Uh, the council would retain, as we framed it, the council would retain all of its independence. The primary challenge that I'll observe over the last 30 years in watching the operations of the academy is it is vastly under-resourced. It requires um, the contributions and good nature of 73 police departments around the state to operate. Um, almost all of the training assistants, almost all of the instructors are volunteer. Um, the budget is an afterthought in the, in the grand scheme of the state budget. There's no budget for uh, investigators to assist with the professional um, conduct investigations that are increasingly taking uh, center stage. Uh, there's, if it were some large, robust budget that um, could conceivably be leached onto by another organization to try to bleed it uh, to fund something else, this would be a completely different equation. But it is so under-resourced that there's just, there's no ability to, the only way that osmosis can work here is to infuse more resources into the operations of the academy. They just don't have enough people. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough resources to do the mission that they've been charged with. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just give an example with the criminal justice. Or, I'm gonna, uh, um, Mr. Sorrell and Mr. Sheets, I believe have to leave. So thank you. And we'll be back to this another, next week, okay? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you both. And Cindy, I don't know if you're staying with us or going, but okay. All right, Senator Rahm, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, so, so let's just say we wanted the Criminal Justice Council to be able to work with racial justice organizations to give grants to um, communities that want to have community-led conversations about what public safety looks like in their community. And that might lead them into conversations about moving resources from policing to other forms of public safety. What would it look like for the back end support for the Criminal Justice Council to go to administering grants like that if they were part of a larger organization that might have different philosophical feelings about those kinds of grants being given out? Um, so uh, two answers to that question. One, operationally, they would have the assets of an entire division, uh, administrative division that handles grant administration, accounting and things of that nature to administer those grants. Um, from a philosophical point of view, um, uh, it's no secret that uh, we have disagreed with a number of pieces of legislation that have been passed over the last 18 months or so. But uh, once they become law, our job is to execute them to the full extent of our capabilities. And that is exactly what we have done. That's what we would continue to do under the construct that you're describing, Senator. And I believe that if the training council or if the council wanted to go in that direction, it would have to be it's not in their jurisdiction or their duties right now. So it would have to be legislatively given to them, I think. And then as Commissioner Sherling says, they would be expected to obey the law. Yeah, the, I mean, the most important point there is that um, in its existing form, uh, I don't want you to cross check this with Director Sheets. I do not believe there's any capacity to execute what you just described. There just aren't enough people and not enough resources to execute a program of that nature, where within the Department of Public Safety, we do that every day. Senator Clarkson. Oh, I thought you had your hand up, I'm sorry. Okay, and I just will remind us that we in S124 um, charged the council and the academy and the department and i don't know who else to uh investigate whether or not the academy should live under an agency and if so where so we we asked them to to investigate this so um let's um Move on then to other people who want to weigh in. And Bill, Sheriff Bill, I see you. Senator Clarkson, did you have a question first? 
Yes, well, you just raised a, a, a good question, which is, uh, remind me when we asked for that update, because I don't think it was a report, but we asked them to weigh in on that, didn't we? And when no, we asked we... them to come to us with a suggestion. So uh, this time period that we're looking at would be a good moment for that suggestion. This is their suggestion. Yes, I should. That, no, no. The... OK, go ahead. So I just want to clarify, because I think it was a little bit of a mixed message that my understanding from uh, Commissioner Sherling is that the recommendation is that the council continue its independence. Yes. Just, but be incorporated in some capacities in the agency at, at, to benefit from all the administrative resources and grant opportunity, you know, all the, 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 uh, all the resources that are in that, that would be in that agency that would benefit the council and the academy. Well, we what we asked for was not but, not to look at the the placement of the council. That was not in the equation at all. It said where should the academy live, and come to us with a recommendation. And that's what they're doing. Is coming to us with a recommendation. That was the we asked them. In fact, we had in there, but the house took it off. Should it even live in Pittsfield? Right. Or wait, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, we we had that in there also, and and um, should it maybe live it under an institution of higher education? I mean, there were, but we asked them for that recommendation, and this is their recommendation. So I see Commissioner Sherling has his hand up again. And yes, then Bill, Madam Chair, Chair Bill, I was. I was just going to add that uh, we uh, we were part of that preliminary engagement process, and we engaged the stakeholders, uh, chiefs, sheriffs, uh, the law enforcement advisory board, the previous version of what was the criminal justice training council, because the new council was not seated until uh, yeah. January, and there was unanimous um, agreement. Uh, we also engaged uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, um, the mayor's coalition. Um, a variety of representative government entities and unanimously those organizations were in support of moving the operations of the academy itself within the agency of public safety in the manner that we framed it where it was under a division of support services and not uh, embedded or uh, accountable to the state police. The important caveat is the new council has only met twice and has not in its entirety weighed in on this just because they're brand new. Sheriff Bell? Madam Chair, and Commissioner, he just explained that uh, I put on my other hat being the chair of the LEAB. We did have a, a quite active discussion on this. And you gotta remember the LEAB is made up of uh, just about all law enforcement in Vermont, plus like someone from the attorney general's office, defender general, uh, Vermont leagues and cities and towns, and it was unanimous uh, to move the academy, just like you were talking about, just what the commissioner explained, um, to the DPS or the, if you created the new agency of public safety. And, uh, you know, we want to see the independence, sure, we want to continue that. And, uh, you know, the commissioner is he's assured that's that's the way it's going to be so you know we're on, we're on board with the move so uh, and it was unanimous on the leab side thank you maybe we could um someday hear from um mike de to see how the fire cat how that works because that it it's kind of parallel to this it, the academy would be under the agency as the fire academy is now but the council isn't. Does that make sense? I'm just here and maybe we can duplicate the, the language somehow. And if I may, Madam Chair, one of the reasons we think this makes sense is because as these two parallel um, public safety first responder training organizations move forward, there is the potential to leverage experience, technology, certain kinds of training, leadership training in public safety, for example, we currently replicate in two different places. It, there are tremendous uh, possibilities in the future 
um, by having a training division within an agency of public safety. We, I, I just can't emphasize enough the, in, in my, I don't know how many years I've been in state government now, it seems like forever with COVID, but the fragmentation of effort is costing taxpayers in terms of repetitive effort, delays, and extra costs that just don't need to be there. Okay, does anybody else wanna weigh in on the placement, on the uh, suggestion of placing the academy in an agency and yet maintaining the independence of the um, uh, council? Uh, Chief Falco, did you wanna weigh in on that or because we can move on to another topic if we want to. Ma Madam Chair, I can wait because what I'm going to testify to anyway will dovetail with this issue. Okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Rahm? I just, I just want to say that I'm, I'm such a visual person and I'm on the website and it says Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. And then when you go to click on the council members, it says Vermont Criminal Justice Council. So I just want to make sure I understand there is no longer a criminal justice training council. Yes. Okay. Someone should change that on the website, but it was just confusing me. Yes, I'm sure we just we that became effective just a couple months ago, and I suspect that they've just been um, busy with other issues. But we will remind them. Um, yes, Sheriff Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, I think that underlines just one of many ways that the, the Academy staff is under-resourced. Um, we've, we've worked with them on, on various uh, IT issues, but uh, that being said, I'm happy to deliver that message to the people that work on that. Thank you. Um, so let's um, move to, does anybody, um, we want to hear what your, <laughs> thoughts are about the agency in general, other issues with it, um, whatever. This is just a conversation so that we can get everything in. So um, let's go to you then, Chief Fekos, or Director, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I am Tony Fekos, Director of Enforcement and Safety Division for the Vermont Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, since I'm no longer, I guess, responding to directly to the executive order, um, but some of the things that I've already testified to in the House, but it remain the same in terms of, you know, overall, I absolutely believe and support in, in the, uh, the future vision, the 10 points of, of police reform and modernization that have been already laid out. How we get there is, to, you know, I think is still, you know, work in progress, obviously. That's why we're here. Um, there in the, as far as the, the the Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, specifically, we have you know we have um, we do a lot within this division of enforcement and safety, and we have the driver's ed program, the motorcycle uh, education, rider education program, school bus safety, and then when you get into the criminal investigations and and a business support end of end of the investigative side of the house, you know we're working with our de dealers, the vehicle inspection program, and then lastly, and as I think it's what we're most known for is the commercial vehicle enforcement team uh, unit. And, and these folks are highly, highly specialized as all of our, 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 uh, our employees are here, um, but it's all part of highway safety. And that's, so we look at some of those, you know, what are some of the similarities in mission? Um, you know, so I'm gonna, in very broad terms, one of the greatest strengths I always felt in Vermont law enforcement is the fact that we've had one academy that you know, it doesn't matter what the shoulder patch, whether it was you know Montpelier Police, uh, I went to the academy with many many state troopers and and as well as uh, DMV personnel. And the fact that we have that foundation, I think, is a, is a great strength to Vermont. There's no question in all of these conversations that uh, Vermont, in terms of law enforcement and policing, it's kind of a you know the haves and have-nots, especially when you know when we talk about municipal policing um, and what communities are willing to pay for and. And then, uh, so my point about one of the areas why I supported the, you know, the, the, this concept of an agency of public safety is really to, um, I think it really fits well with, as we look for police modernization and, and consistency, uh, even though we are very unique in what uh, we do here at, at, you know, with DMV enforcement and safety, um, 
if we weren't doing that job, for example, of the truck inspections and working with our federal partners, um, you know, really nobody else does it in Vermont. I mean, there are some officers that are trained to certain degrees that they can do it, they can do vehicle inspections, but that's our primary focus is, is our is making sure that we um, help support our trucking industry as well as uh, make sure that you know our, our highways are safe for them. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity with training. And that's where I think, as I mentioned, I think that uh, the more we can uh, have a, almost standardized training, and I don't just mean you know a mandate class here or there. Just earlier this morning, I was on the phone with a, a you know federal agent who's uh, an instructor for uh, in Chicago, and also and we were just talking about how Vermont we really need to modernize, and that in terms that's you know philosophically how do we approach training and everything laid out in this agency you know um, the architecture of this could really deliver that. And that's something where, I mean, I can do all the training I want and, and, and I, we have vision here within DMV of what we want to accomplish. Um, but again, it's it's gonna be compartmented. It's not necessarily gonna be in line with, you know, for example, the, the Vermont State Police are doing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, that uh, Vermont would be very proud of with their state police. For example, they're a CALEA accredited organization. I mean, there's a lot of, so there's a lot of opportunity for joint, you know, joint projects, again, sharing of, you know, of, of technical platforms. Um, and, but I think the end result, though, would be incremental for us because I wanna make really clear, uh, our folks do a phenomenal job. They're highly respected in the industry um, as well as with their, by their peers. And you know, I couldn't be prouder. And they're very, um, you know, and, they, and they're, they're, they have a lot of pride in that pride goes to their identity. And yet there's sort of some concern that, um, that they may have that uh, they don't wanna lose that, but also at the same time, where can we add to that training value that consistently a policy, professional standards and accountability um, to kind of take us to that next level? Um, you know, then, uh, so that's why historically, I've, I've, I think um, why th this conversation keeps, keeps popping up again. Um, you know, and especially now with, uh, you know, we're right in really reevaluating how we police, uh, whether it's a, highly specialized avenue, such as what we do with commercial vehicle enforcement and, and you know, regulating, uh, you know, the automotive industry, if you will, here in Vermont. But there's, those are the things why um, I think create um, some, some opportunity, as long as, again, um, nothing detracts from the success uh, and how we, how we do business here with, uh, you know, with our division. Um, is that your hand, Senator Clarkson? No, okay. Um, so the way I understand that the executive order worked and I, and I think that I heard you say you <laughs> agreed with it is that there would be two departments, um, in the, under the agency and the, the one department would include, um, VSP and motor vehicles that the, as two just different divisions i believe um am i that, right that, about that that is correct it'd be that under under the under the executive order the language was specifically creates a department of law enforcement and that would have a division of the vermont state police and a division of motor vehicle enforcement um and there are absolutely two very distinctly different organizations. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, the responsibility that Vermont State Police have, you know, they're handling the 911 calls. Anything that comes up, they are the go-to, um, including all of their special teams and their unique resources. Uh, you know, we have a very different job, um, but yet we're all law enforcement officers. We all support one another. And, and certainly anything that creates better interagency or you know, division integration, I think would go a long way, for example, Highway safety task forces, in other words, working with troopers side by side on various details with our commercial vehicle enforcement folks so, um, to protect our trucking and commercial vehicle corridors. Um, you know, there's a significant number of the accidents that com involve commercial vehicles in many cases uh, was caused by a non-commercial vehicle. So we have a lot of, um, you know, it's not overlap, it's just an opportunity to do it even better. Um, but the fundamental back backstory there, though, is that is that accountability, that professional standard, the, the you know, policy, um, and this is something that uh, you know I dealt with even as a Montpelier police chief, that you know nobody in Vermont should be held to you know should be 
should have different standards of expectations when, when they have an interaction with a law enforcement officer. And, and quite frankly, as we all know, we're, it's all over the map. Um, so, but does that answer your question in terms of back to the, the structure specifically? Yeah, it answers my question that I, I think that you saw, see that as a first step is, um, and the division, each division would keep their own identity. Yes. Yeah. Any questions for Chief? Okay, so I, I do know that um, John Federico, he works with, for you, right? That is Am correct. Right? He, yes, yeah. he is one of our commercial vehicle enforcement inspectors. And I th think that he um, wanted to also weigh in on this and I don't think, oh, there he is. I can't, he, it looks like, John, it looks like you are in witness protection because you are so dark, I can't see you, but I can see your um, DMV uh, yellow lines behind you. So I knew it was you. I apologize for the lighting uh, in the studio here, um, Madam Chair, but thank you for having me. That's okay. Would you like to weigh in now that since we're talking about that um, uh, right now? Certainly, thank you for the record. I'm John Federico, sure. I'm a commercial vehicle inspector with the Department of Motor Vehicles. I'm also the VSCA representative to the Law Enforcement Advisory Board and the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, and this was a surprise to me uh, as well today to, to learn that we weren't really gonna be speaking directly to the executive order um, as I spoke to the House Government Operations uh, Committee last week, but um, just, narrowly um, speaking um, concerning the Department of Law Enforcement aspect of the, of the previous plan. Um, I, I guess a couple of the things that I would bring up are, are that um, it's, it's not so much the change. I've heard it said that, you know, um, change is, is really the sticking point here. I mean, I think we're all used to change. We're all used to adapting uh, to change. Um, but it's, it's really more of the unknown uh, that's the issue than, than just changing. Uh, no one has a, has a problem when there's a need for change, but it's, uh, it's a lot of the unknown. Um, uh, if, if, if this is going to go forward, I think what we would press for is uh, some level of, uh, of the rank and file being included at high level discussions. Uh, about how this might proceed and as we're, we've not been uh, involved in the past. Um, and I'll be frank with you, we, we, I understand uh, uh, everything that, that um, Director Fakos has said and, um, and I understand some of, of the goals here, but we're still not currently seeing the benefit that this would be to either our department, our mission or the taxpayers. Um, the Department of Law Enforcement, of course, would require more than just the state police to be a department. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a full department. Um, and we're not quite sure yet why, um, why if philosophically this was important um, and useful uh, that other law enforcement agencies in the state, um, and I understand that they, were included in the in the uh, executive order, but under future study. Um, but um, just sort of wondering if it's if it's good for one group, wouldn't it be good for all groups and to be discussing it uh, as a whole? Um, I mean, we we currently are lucky enough not to have issues with funding, so I don't think it's a funding issue. Um, we're we're really tied into what I would call the neural network of the DMV. I think it's going to be um, I think there's going to be a, a lot of, of things that come up. I mean, it's, it, to me, I liken it to kind of like those flipping houses shows. I mean, every time we are going to open a wall here, we're going to find an, a new issue or a new problem and it's going to cost potentially more money. And there's a lot of unknowns there. I mean, we, we've talked about um, how, how there are some known increases right off the bat. This isn't a money saving operation anymore uh, uh, or, or, plan that I've, uh, I've heard it said. Um, and so that, that, that bureaucracy that may be created in the Department of Law Enforcement just right now looks to be um, unnecessary to us. Um, but again, if, if we were involved in future high level discussions, perhaps those 
those um, those ideas would change, perhaps not. Um, but um, um, you know, uh, we're not the only ones concerned about that. Um, you know, I won't speak for for him, but uh, there was some testimony from the trooper side of things that um, that bureaucracy um, that that would be created and be more costly would be concerning as well. Um, and and I would just lastly say that uh, you know we we in some ways in, uh, operate like a different law enforcement agency, just like a Montpelier PD or a St. Johnsbury PD. We were, we easily can pick up the phone, share training, share ideas, share, um, uh, share operations. We can do it even easier because we're state employees, the state police are state employees. There's a lot of those things uh, that we can do right now and without having to go through um, changes that, that may cost the state a lot of money in the future. Again, that said, we are, we're certainly um, open to the continued discussions. We'd love to be uh, involved at a higher level um, than previously uh, if, if this is gonna go forward so that, um, so that our voices are heard and, uh, and, and that we may also bring our expertise to the table uh, so that you know, we don't, hopefully we can help avoid any walls that are opened and, find out we need new electricity, you know, throughout the house, new roof and all that, that kind of good stuff. So appreciate your, uh, your time. Thanks, John. I, I, I do apologize for the fact that um, we aren't speaking directly to the executive order because we've set this up last week before we knew that the house had opposed the executive order. So there is no executive order anymore. So, um, and in terms of um, speaking to the, higher in the higher level conversations. I think that's what this is. The, um, the, the, if we do this, it, it will be done legislatively. It will be done by statute. So the, this is where the conversations will be held, I believe. Am I right, committee? This is, I mean, we, we will be writing the, the statute. Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. John, I really appreciate your, uh, testimony, I was going to ask uh, Director Fakus, because up till this point, everyone that's testified seems to be in full support of uh, what was contained to some degree in the executive order. I still think there's some discussion as to whether both chambers had to vote no or yes. I know that certainly the administration's legal counsel feels differently than some of the other folks. But that, that aside, this committee has also put forward a bill uh, more than once, uh, which would reorganize the public safety uh, situation. But I'm especially um, grateful to John for, for providing some uh, testimony, because I think it is important. Um, full disclosure, my wife worked for DMV for many years oh. uh, in a mobile unit. She had nothing but good things to say uh, about things and the way they ran. Um, but it, it, you know, if you have 100 people in a room, you're never going to get or rarely will you get a 100 to nothing vote on anything. It just that's just the way things are. So I think it's especially important that we hear from the rank and file. And John, if you have specific examples of given this possibly going forward, what would change for the average DMV worker and pick whatever um, job that they have uh, versus what's in place now? If you can think of any examples. Um, thank you. I, I can't uh, think of any examples right now because all, um, all that we've heard to this point is just that um, nothing will change. Uh, we'll simply move over um, and everything will remain the same. And, and, um, but, there's, but there's a lot of confusion around that. Um, it, just, just for example, we're, we're not quite sure whether um, the the executive order referred to our civilian staff that are that's intertwined with uh, some of our operations comes with us doesn't come with us. Um, there, you know, Title Twenty Three is a big thick volume of law that that that's got the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles written all over it. I, mean, I don't know if you can just simply replace the title and and then everything goes smoothly. Um, uh, we. Um, and like I said, because because it's it's just sort of been a, a, a flat, no discussion, but just a flat. You know, nothing's going to change. Don't worry about it. It's 
going to just, everything's going to stay the same. Um, you know, we're, it's the, un, like I said, it's not the change, it's the weary of the unknown that, um, that I think has been the biggest uh, sticking point uh, so far. Um, okay. I mean, we, we, certainly there's a little lament that, you know, the inspectors have been around for a hundred years. We just, we just celebrated that anniversary of uh, the history of Vermont motor vehicle inspectors. And that, you know, and that's ultimately going to change. It's not a reason to, to, to make this decision to go forward or not, but um, um, it, you know, it's just, it's part of the, it's part of the identity part of it as well. So maybe I could turn the question a little bit to uh, Tony and you must have had someone comment negatively or at least express some doubt about, about the change. Can you offer any sort of reassurance to the folks who might be watching this? And John, I'm very sympathetic. I've gone through four or five ownership changes in the, in the job I used to have. And when they say that nothing's gonna change except the color of the check, uh, that's the first indication you know that there's gonna be a big change coming. So uh, <laughs> Tony, if you could just sort of uh, reassure uh, the folks that, that work with John. Sure. I mean, right now, the the, uh, the executive, I'm going to go back to the executive order language. It was specific to to the, the director position as well as all sworn DMV. So I've already made clear to um, one of our non-sworn staff that because, that he's directly involved with this commercial vehicle enforcement unit. He does audits and inspections and, they, you know, that's absolutely part of it. Um, in all respect to Commissioner Manoli and I, we also have... Um, you know, some discussions that we're still hammering out on, you know, what if it's no longer an enforcement of safety division, for example, um, standing up a, a new division that would, you know, directly uh, support business, the business side of the function. But either way, we'd have to still be embedded in my, my vision, um, still have to be absolutely embedded into DMV. Uh, for example, we have attorney general, uh, you know, people from the attorney general's office assigned to DMV. We have people from ADS assigned to DMV. Um, so that's how I would envision it. And I want to make really, and if I didn't make this clear enough in the beginning, uh, again, it's, we're not broke. Um, this, we, it's a very highly functioning team. Um, but where we get into some of the, some of the, um, more nuanced opportunity and changes that could impact, uh, a sworn officer of the DMV, um, in the case of looking at their, you know, if there was uh, an allegation of misconduct, it is a different process than if it was, for example, currently uh, for a Vermont State Trooper, um, because of you know a lot of that has to do with just some of the, you know there's union issues, different different unions, different structures, and and how those are handled. Um, and I don't I don't want to just put up that as something negative. I'm saying, but in terms of the accountability piece, though, um, and what I'm looking to is take a, something that works well in my vision that I think I certainly. Uh, you know, I really buy into what Commissioner Schilling has laid out is that we're taking something that works really well, but can we actually make it even better? Um, policy development and training opportunities um, and, and staff development is, is the area that I've been highlighting consistently with that. Um, as far as it's not going to change for anybody, um, the workstation locations, you know, everything right now, would, uh, there's, I don't see a reason to change that. But maybe there could be opportunity down the road. Um, again, thinking about um, you know a workspace or having uh, in a barracks where um, uh, you know again be more cross pollination, if you will, of different agencies and ideas. Um, but I want to make clear also we work very well with the Vermont State Police um, and our municipal, all the municipal departments, and because we're a unique resource, um, you know, in that regard. But in terms of the unknown, uh, those, are, those are questions that I think are concerning the union membership that I just can't answer at this time. All right, thank you both. Yeah, I, th I think that, um, and I don't wanna go back to this, these studies, but we've had about 10 or 15 studies done over the past number of years. And every single one of them has recommended that all um, the state sworn officers should be somehow they should keep their identity with their um, with DMV, and it's Fish and Wildlife DLC and DMV are the three, and that they should keep their identity and think of it much as the Attorney General's office. They're in the Attorney General's office, but they're actually assigned to someplace. And I, that's been a recommendation since I started here in 2000. 
three I, that has been a recommendation every single time there's been one done. So, um, Senator Clarkson. Uh, thanks. Uh, I don't know if this is a question for John or for Tony, but how many people are in the DMV law enforcement division and how many of them are, as you call them, sworn officers? Uh, I'm not sure what they're sworn to. I mean, that means they're certified. They're certified. Okay. Because we're, I guess you could call us all sworn officers too, because we all swear oaths. Um, so it's, anyway, how many uh, are in the division totally and, and how many are law enforcement or sworn law enforcement versus uh, administration or non sworn? Sure. Sure, we have the division is made up of 41 uh, full time employees. And then during the riding season, uh, we at, we we hired uh, seasonal employees, uh, approximately 40 additional seasonal employees of the 41 full time, 27 of those are for full time law enforcement positions. So, again, every one of our inspectors, whether they're a detective or you know working on the commercial vehicle side of the house, they're all full time uh, Vermont law enforcement officers and uh, with some very uh, unique specialized training and experience. Thanks, and the 40 seasonal are, are not- uh, They're just riding, they're just motorcycle riding instructors that help out, but they're, sorry, they're, but they're part of the division when they are employed. Ah, okay, great. And so, and, and I guess this is also a question for Michael Sherling, which is, as I recall, uh, stage one in this is including DMV, but that we're still, you're still discussing fish and wildlife and liquor and lottery, uh, or are they part now of this proposal? I thought uh, I, that they were kind you. of stage two. That's correct, Senator. As proposed in the executive order, uh, there would be that would be a secondary phase. So there would be some additional, uh, I hesitate to call it a report because as Senator White indicated, this has been studied and restudied and every report comes right. back the same. Yeah. Um, but that would of course be at your discretion um, if it were uh, a bill, uh, how you'd wanna handle that. We, we, given the current operating environment, the pace uh, and all of the support we provide to the, the COVID operations, I'm not sure we would want to accelerate things, um, but there are a variety of different ways to phase implementation yeah. in the future. Phasing in is, yeah, yeah, you could, got it. Thank you very much. While I have the floor, Madam Chair, could sure. I add? Sure. Um, I, I want, uh, without uh, sounding argumentative, I want to provide some clarifying information regarding Inspector Federico's testimony. I, I do want to take issue with some of the things that he said. We have been actively engaging every sworn law enforcement officer uh, and every member of public safety organizations in the state on this topic for almost 14 months. We have circulated and recirculated drafts of modernization strategies. The Secretary of Transportation and the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles met with the DMV staff in May of 2020. One of the items brought up for conversation at the highest cabinet level at that point by Inspector Federico was this topic. Um, we have actively solicited stakeholder feedback as we have uh, circulated that modernization strategy. We have testified side by side with the VSEA on this topic going back to January in this committee when we were testifying live in January and February pre-pandemic. Um, the VSEA president was in the room for that testimony. Um, so I wanna be really clear and unequivocal that there has never been uh, a law enforcement or public safety engagement process that has been more robust or more sweeping than this one in my 30 years uh, in public safety in Vermont. Thank you, thank you. Um, I see that um, the treasurer's office is on here and I think that late in the day we changed the uh, time to three o'clock for retirement issues and you're welcome to stay with us but I assume that you're busy doing other things probably and that we will continue this until um, for a little bit longer. Um, Allison, is that a hand? Yeah, yeah. I just while well, Michael had the floor, I just love to ask the additional personnel, Michael. That is in, as I recall, it's a quite a bit smaller. The fish and wildlife crowd and the and the liquor and lottery. I mean, it's not eighty people when it's 
it's not 81 people. It's like, it's smaller, right? Uh, Fish and Wildlife is, I would say, roughly the same uh, size and uh, liquor. A the liquor or, no, I, I no in, the, in the 40 range. Okay, 40, 41. I thought you said 21, 27 sworn officers in DMV. I was right. And the rest were, uh, there, there were 81 total. He talked about 41 full time, 27 were uh, law enforcement. Right. And it's so, the law enforcement. Right. So we're, it's just the 27, sort of roughly 27 to 30 fish and wildlife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and we will hear. And we liquor and lottery is about the same? No. Smaller. Uh, is That's quite a bit smaller, Senator. Yeah. That's a, like 10 or 12. Uh, yeah. It's not that and, many. And for the record, uh, we have very deliberately contemplated the congruity of operations of these various entities. And, and I was frank with this committee last year, I, I'm not sure to what extent um, moving liquor into the agency makes sense. There is a very small fragment of what they do that has anything to do with enforcement. It's so it is right. mm -hmm. the different kind of operation. So um, we have been, um, we've been as thoughtful as we have the capacity to be, um, and we have not prejudged which pieces make the most uh, sense um, at this stage uh, because of some of the, the, the timing issues and, and things of that nature. So thank you. Thank, thank you. So um, on this, um, the issue of the agency, and, and we will keep this conversation going. Clearly, this isn't the last time we're going to do it. And by the, when we do it next week, we'll hope to have some kind of a draft that people can actually look at to see the language, which will be helpful. But um, Tim Page, are you, who are you representing? Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm representing the Vermont Chiefs of Police Association. I'm the current president. Oh, great. Also Chief of Police in St. Johnsbury. Um, I'm basically here to uh, uh, support the uh, transition to an agency uh, format. Uh, mainly the chiefs uh, aren't involved in the minutia of who's going to be what under the agency, uh, but we do see benefits in its formation. Um, we are going through such a time that uh, the training and uh, recruitment of officers is going to be paramount. Um, and uh, having a, an agency that would be a lead agency with the academy uh, as part of that to advance the academy's mission and uh, personnel, I, I think is huge. Um, we, we need to improve our training. We need to improve our, our personnel that we're hiring. We need to set a professional standard for every organization out there. And I think we can do that uh, uh, through a, a robust uh, training uh, um, of our people. And I think that can only be accomplished if we have the, um, the funds and the resources to do that. And I think as an agency, that'll afford us that opportunity. Not to mention that departments such as myself that are smaller uh, rely on uh, the uh, Department of Public Safety right now for uh, certain investigations, uh, um, sometimes manpower issues, things of that nature. So uh, I think bringing it all together under one, one auspice would be uh, uh, beneficial for everyone, uh, both in, uh, in resources, but uh, uh, budgeting. And uh, so I'm here just to show support for the agency. Thank you. And are you speaking, you're speaking for the Chiefs Association also? Yes, Madam Secretary. I, I um, polled the Chiefs uh, uh, before coming here and uh, overwhelmingly in support of, of this move. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, Thanks. Any questions for, um, how about the Sheriff's Association? Anybody want to speak for the Sheriff's Association? You know, Madam Chair, Sheriff Boniak, um, as president of the association, the 
were were in favor of moving the the academy and 911, you know, to DPS or the Agency of Public Safety. You know, we're we want to remain neutral as far as um, advocating for or against creating the agency. Um, so that's that's our stance. But we do want to see the we'd really like to see the academy and the 911 board. Um, go over, uh, just like uh, Chief Page mentioned about, especially the academy. Um, so that's our stance currently. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else wanna um, weigh in on this, on where we are right now with, with it? Vince, I saw you um, joined us, did you have Anything you would like to say? Well, maybe he didn't join us. Well, he's there. He looks like I he's see. thinking. <laughs> I think he's giving a speech at CBSR. Yeah. <laughs> he's seeking refuge in our committee as usual. Oh, <laughs> yes, many people come and sit in our committee to get away from the hustle and bustle, but um, so I, just think any, I think he's probably waiting for the temp workers discussion. Okay. Um, right. In that case, I'll just ignore him. Um, so does anybody else have anything else that they would like to throw out? Um, on this issue right now. And then let's get everybody here the next time we bring it up. Senator Clarkson? Yes, um, I'd just like to go to Commissioner <laughs> Sherling's uh, question because it sounds like you did a pretty robust survey of everybody in law enforcement or at least a large number of people in law enforcement when you said you had uh, reached out and, and publicly engaged so many people on this on this issue. And I, I think for us to make, you know, as we make this, as we consider this, it would be great to know if you could get us the number of people that uh, you reached out to, the number of people who responded, you know, just so people understand the public engagement, uh, the robustness of that feedback. I think that would be helpful in making the case. I'm happy to provide an outline. I think, Senator, there, there may be a report that we drafted back in December on some of this engagement that we sent. I, oh, with the there's numbers. so many reports I need I to apologize. check. And, and, well, it, I need to make sure that, that this is one of the topics that had a report. So I'll, <laughs> I'll double check that. Great, because I, I think it would be useful as we go forward. And John, is John still with us? Yeah, you are. I would say that um, what should happen is <laughs> as we go forward and whether we ultimately pass a bill or not, we need to get um, people's thoughts in there. So if, if um, your members have, have uh, comments or would like to see language in the bill, we need to get that to yeah. us so that we can um, make sure that we're going in the right direction. I mean, when we talk, I don't know if you were with us when we talked about the uh, putting language into to guarantee the independence of the council, the criminal justice council. If there's language that needs to be in in the bill to um, guarantee the uh, not independence but the identity and preserving the identity of people who are not in the uh, Vermont State Police in their individual um, units we need to get that language and anything else you think is relevant. All right, thank you for that opportunity. We'll uh, work on that. Sure, thank you. Um, anybody else have anything right now? Uh, Senator Polina? Yeah, I'm just wondering, I don't know if there's an answer to this question or not, but I'm wondering how large an agency we're actually talking about creating, I mean, we're talking about something, obviously it's not gonna, oh, not gonna rise to the level of Agency of Human Services, but I'm just curious, is there any way of talking about the size of the agency that we're creating and what it means relative to state government? 
Certainly, Senator, it's a great question. It would add uh, somewhere between 120 and 140 people to a department that currently has uh, a little over 600 employees. Uh, so by contrast, the Agency of Human Services has uh, 3,600 or so uh, employees. Um, we are very mindfully did not draft something that looks like a super agency. Um, you may recall uh, prior iterations of this that have been drafted into legislation have contemplated moving all regulatory functions, Department of Corrections, Emergency Medical Services, other things that uh, would create a super agency. And that's not what was proposed here. Because so it's interesting, I've heard from a few constituents who are not saying this is my opinion, but I've heard from a few constituents who have said this is no time to be building a super police agency, that kind of an attitude, given the fact that there's skepticism about police operations around the country, not just in Vermont, obviously. And so it made me just think about the size and scope of what we're trying to do here. And also, as you are well, well aware, we've had issues with bias policing and issues like that around the state. And I'm wondering if there'd be anything that would change or improve if this kind of consolidation would in any way improve our ability to deal with racial bias in, in policing and those kinds of things. I mean, data collection, we've had issues around the state that have been to the disadvantage of BIPOC people. I'm just wondering whether or not did you see any way of using this transition as a way to improve the ability of us to do um, anti-bias policing and things of that sort. Very much so, Senator, um, and with, uh, I think, two primary areas, uh, well, three primary areas of focus, um, unifying um, the supervision of law enforcement under the elected chief executive uh, is one, that's one of the goals. I mean, the governor ultimately is responsible for delivering bias-free operations in state government, um, in part at the direction of the legislature based on the statutes and the budgets that you uh, create. Uh, secondarily, uh, the, you mentioned data, um, unifying the mechanisms with which we collect and then swiftly report uh, data, not just on um, interactions with communities of color, but data across all law enforcement operations. And then third, uh, the front end of this hearing was uh, largely uh, talking about training, but increasing the investment in and uh, broadening the influence on the training environment in a way that helps to unify that rather than uh, keep the fragmented approach that we have now. All we believe are incremental steps to uh, improve our outcomes relative to bias-free operation. Senator Rahm. I was just looking through some of the committees of the Criminal Justice Council and I know that uh, the chairman's no longer with us, but I was curious, I was just looking, for example, at the use of force committee, and it looked like a lot of local law enforcement folks, including, um, you know, from towns and state government. Um, is anyone, uh, Commissioner Sherling, paying attention to the racial and gender diversity of some of these committees and task forces? Are you doing that right now in, in your department? We are very much doing that. We have a fair and partial uh, policing committee that's uh, co-led by a civilian who also serves as our, um, our equity advisor. Um, I can't uh, speak to the nuances of how those committees were formed relative to the council as that was done um, by the, the chair and the director. I'm, I'm just a member of the council. Do you have a philosophical approach that you encourage your team to be guided with in this regard? Uh, yes, um, in a put most simplistically, uh, broad engagement um, with communities with special emphasis on extra outreach uh, to those have, who have been uh, historically marginalized. Um, and that is one of the, um, the core reasons we've got an FIP uh, team. They engage on a monthly basis with over a hundred stakeholders um, from a, a diverse uh, backgrounds um, on this topic of, of operations, policy training, um, and communicate with them generally about things that are happening uh, statewide. So that's, uh, that's our primary operating methodology right now. My last question is, uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Do you, do you see opportunities to pay more civilians to engage with you in this work, knowing that it's kind of an additional burden for them to engage on these issues and continue to give their time and capacity? Uh, stipends, yes, we've actually uh, recommended that. I think uh, that may be too many documents, but that may be drafted into the modernization uh, plan. Actually, I'm fairly confident it is um, to look at uh, increasing, uh, either establishing or increasing stipends for civilian participation and things that would otherwise be volunteer uh, efforts. Thank you. I saw uh, Sheriff Anderson, you had your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up on uh, Senator Polina's uh, comment on uh, benefits, specifically around training, uh, back at the end of 2019, before we started looking at law enforcement uh, in the way we are now, uh, I was engaging with a, an organization uh, that uh, it was a training system and platform uh, that I had the benefit of uh, uh, going to down in uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Uh, that program is now closed. I was talking with the vendor to bring them here and it's a $100,000 program. Uh, so to the point of the agency, uh, not to say that they would necessarily need to promote uh, this, but the access to funding, uh, I think, is a way that we could bring in some uh, leading edge training that, uh, that deals with this. Uh, when we talk about uh, fair and impartial policing, uh, the current training model delivers the cognitive level. Uh, and while I'm no expert on Bloom's taxonomy uh, of teaching uh, and education, uh, the, the reality is, is what we are capable of delivering within the, the Academy's budget right now uh, is simply a cognitive level. Uh, we're not doing uh, nearly as much as we could with experiential learning uh, or, or uh, in areas where we uh, need to work towards culture. So uh, to that point, I want to say that uh, inside the agency, the Academy has a far better chance of providing higher levels of training, not just on fair and impartial policing, but also in areas uh, unrelated, um, but also important to culture, such as supervisory training and executive training. Uh, as a new sheriff, uh, I, I had the benefit of learning from many sheriffs who were willing to take the time to support me learning my position uh, from uh, people like the commissioner who's willing to take the time to explain state government. And we should have that formalized. Um, to, to figure it out by asking the right person is, is somewhat of a, uh, splash approach. And then to Senator Rahm's uh, observations on the Academy's website, uh, I just reviewed the list of committees. I noticed it's still the, the former training council's committees. Uh, we have met, I believe, twice now. Uh, and uh, to the point of why the Academy's website is not currently updated, the, uh, the position responsible for uh, updating that uh, was vacated in December uh, the person was just hired. And so uh, there is a, a piece where uh, they are actively working to update information. Uh, there's several committees that are created that are not listed. Uh, and I can't give a, an accurate representation of what they are right now, but I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions, concerns right now? So let's, um, when we take this up next week, we will have um, hopefully a draft. And if anybody has, what I'm going to suggest is that if anybody has language that they um, would like to get in here to, for us to consider, um, Amarin, is that, um, could I say that um, uh, your point people would be uh, John Federico, um, uh, Tony Fakus, um, I, I think that uh, Bill Sorrell and um, uh, Bill Sorrell and Mark Anderson may be around the, indep the independence of the uh, council. If there's anybody else that wants to get language in there, not that, that we will adopt all the language necessarily, but we can get it in so that we can look at it in a draft form. Does that make sense, committee? Okay. <laughs> and if any committee members have uh, suggested language, I'd suggest that we get them to Amarin also. Um, okay. 
So with that, may we, may we, Madam Chair, may we have a, a, a five or 10 minute break to go do the, our, our, our stretch our limbs? That is exactly what I was just oh. about to say. Good. Is um, let's take a, let's see, it is uh, 301. We will be back here at 310. That's nine minutes. We should be able to do it. And everybody to put off your.